Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the Friday Ramblings. It is November, that means it's a whole new month and that means a whole new set of ramblings. We are of course continuing our march through the most fun to discuss championships in professional wrestling and we have a doozy of one today. We are going to discuss the United States Championship originally from the NWA's Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling also occasionally known as Jim Crockett Promotions. Eventually part of WCW and currently part of World Wrestling Entertainment as after the buyout they decided to keep the legacy of the title. However, we are going to do the WWE era as a separate episode next month because I want to make sure that I don't make this episode super long. I like the ramblings to be a respectable length for people to watch where they don't feel like they're having to dedicate a large chunk of their day to it. And I don't want to gloss over too many of the title reigns and general history of the belt. So we're breaking its lineage up. That's the way it's going to go. So the United States Championship was first introduced in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in 1975. Now it should be noted that in the NWA, because the uh, National Championship was the only touring championship, those of you who have watched all my the videos on wrestling championships know that there was not a recognized national tag team championship for the NWA until its later years. So, there was only one that was controlled by the NWA executive board that was seen as the champion of all the territories. Therefore, the whole point of all that buildup was to say this, there was multiple territories at the peak of the NWA's power and influence that utilized a United States Heavyweight Championship. However, the Mid-Atlantic Championship is the most famous because of its survival in 2 WCW. The last promotion to use a United States Championship was the San Francisco-based Big Time Wrestling which ceased operations around 1981. Still, the United States Championship, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, was introduced on January 1st of 1975 and the inaugural champion was the iconic Harley Race. He, Harley was already a well-known wrestler at the time and so this was somebody worth putting a belt on. It very quickly replaced the Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Championship as the top single title in the promotion up through 1986 when Crockett gained control of the NWA World Heavyweight Championship we previously mentioned, making the U.S. title the de facto number two singles belt in the company. I know, I keep... Championship, title, belt. It, they're different synonyms. It's all the same concept. Bear with me, folks that are newer to wrestling. The three terms are thrown around interchangeably, especially by people like me who are historians who are not part of the business. No matter how much I know, no matter how much I learn, no matter how much of a fan I am and how much money I spend, I will never be part of the business as long as I am simply a fan. And I am okay with that. That's why we here at Roulette Productions keep things positive. We do not take our fandom too seriously and try to pretend we're something we're not. And part of that being that when I get going on an interesting topic, sometimes I bounce around my synonyms. So as I was saying, we start it, the United States Championship was for a period considered the top title in the promotion, was eventually supplanted by the NWA World Championship, which is no shame to anybody. 
and on April 6, 1991 episode of the World Championship Wrestling TV show, Nikita Koloff destroyed the classic design used throughout the 1980s when he physically decimated the title belt that was held at the time by Lex Luger. First knocking out Lex Luger with the belt and then taking a or smashing the belt with a ring post. You know, pam, pam. Luger would later appear for a time without a physical championship belt to help sell the angle in his desire to get revenge on Nikita Koloff. Eventually becoming the first to wear the newly designed belt, which was used up through WCW's closing in March 2001. Of course, uh, once Ted Turner bought the company and renamed it World Championship Wrestling, it would be renamed in January of 1991, thus shortly before the angle we spoke of, into the WCW United States Championship, much like many of the other belts in the company. So good times. Let's break down the fun, most fun part here, folks, and that is the individual reigns, or at least the ones most notable. As I said, I may skip over a couple, or at least more quickly lost through them because you know you get re um, multiple time champions, you get very short reigns. We're just gonna kind of see how the list goes, but still. Already we are getting a sense of why the United States Championship is worth talking about. This is a championship that was held by men who at the time they won it were already considered major stars, many of whom would later go on to be bigger stars and continue to hold many other championships, and actually was the top full-time championship in the promotion of Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling at the time, and Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling being a major power promotion in the NWA. So, it was a big deal to win the championship. As I said, we start things off with Harley Race, who defeated Johnny Weaver in a tournament final to become the inaugural champion. 183 days later, Johnny Valentine would win it having to vacate it after three months due to a career-ending injury in a plane crash. This is a very famous plane crash. Um, I don't know, we may go through a history of iconic uh, vehicular accidents that ended careers. I'm not, it's kind of a dark topic. I'm gonna have to look into that later. Talk with some of my uh, behind the scenes folks and see what we can put together still. That is certainly one reason to vacate a championship. Title would be won a little over a month later by uh, Terry Funk, defeating Paul Jones in a tournament final. However, only 18 days later, Paul Jones won it from Terry Funk. A few months later, Blackjack Mulligan would win it, holding it for 217 days, at this point the longest reign with the belt. Paul Jones would win it back, holding it for 43 days, before losing it back, back to Blackjack Mulligan, who would notch on another 204 days. We then get the great Bobo Brazil, who, for those of you who don't know, is often credited with breaking down barriers of racial segregation in professional wrestling, being considered one of the first successful African-American professional wrestlers. So, a historically big deal. Much respect to you, Bobo. Bobo would only hold the belt for 22 days, though, before a young up-and-comer in 1977 named Rich Richard Flair, yep, the future nature boy, 
would pick up his first run with the title, holding it for 84 days before his lifetime rival Ricky Steamboat would win it for 72 days. Our old boy Blackjack Mulligan said he hasn't had enough, and for 77 days reigned supreme before Mr. Wrestling One, aka Tim Woods, would win the belt, holding it for three weeks before Ric Flair got it back and decided to, as the Nature Boy does, show up everybody by beating all of Blackjack Mulligan's individual reign records, holding it for 253 days. That's right, folks. We have a new longevity record set. This was in April of 78 by this point. It would be December of 78 before Ricky Steamboat ruins things for Flair because that's what Steamboat does. Likes to ruin Flair's party. For 105 days, Ricky Steamboat would reign supreme finally in April of 1979. Just a week short of one year since Flair's previous reign, Flair would win it back for another 133 days before vacating it due to winning the World Tag Team Championship. I know this is going to sound like a weird concept to folks who are only familiar with modern wrestling, but there was a rule in the old NWA that a person could only hold an individual championship at a time. Thus, if you won a championship, you would have to vacate one of the two championships you held. This was to theoretically prevent the best out there from simply holding every title in a promotion. Personally, I think this is a rule that really needs to come back. The legendary and certainly infamous Jimmy Snuka would then win it after beating Ricky Steamboat in a tournament title or tournament final for the vacant title. Holding it for an impressive 231 days before Ric Flair wins it back, notching on another 98 days. By this point, it is now January of 1981. And our boy, the hot rod himself, Roddy Piper, wins the championship, also becoming the undisputed championship, as this is during the period where the aforementioned San Francisco-based big-time wrestling would shut down. In August of 81, Wahoo McDaniel would win his first round with the championship, only holding it for a month before having to vacate it due to being injured by Abdullah the Butcher. Sergeant Slaughter wins it in October of 81, holding it for an impressive 229 days after beating previous champion Ricky Steamboat in a tournament final. Wahoo McDaniel, though, would come back and notch another 17 days as champion before Sergeant Slaughter wins it for about a, for 76 days. Wahoo then won it back for 74 days before Greg the Hammer Valentine, another great Hall of Famer, enters the picture. Netting 163 days as champion before Roddy Piper wins it back for two weeks. Greg Valentine then wins it due to referee stoppage when Piper suffers a large cut over his left ear. And Greg would gain another 228 days before the rockin' redneck Dirty Dick Slater decides to be champion managing to hold it for 129 days. Ricky Steamboat finally re-enters the picture, grabbing a 64-day reign for Wahoo McDaniel, wins it for a week, having to vacate it due to Tully Blanchard interfering in 
Wahoo McDaniels title defense. This is in July of 84. It would be not be until October of 84 when another tournament final over Manny Fernandez puts the belt back on Wahoo McDaniels' waist. He would hold it for 167 days before Magnum TA wins it for 120. Tully Blanchard grabs 130 days before losing it back to Magnum TA for 182 in an I Quit Steel Cage match. Before being stripped of the title for attacking NWA President Bob Geigel. Nikita Koloff would then beat Magnum TA in a best of seven series for the vacant title. Before Lex Luger wins the title in July of 87, holding it for 138 days as part of a steel cage match. Appropriately enough, the steel cage match would factor in the next title change when Dusty Rhodes wins it at the Starcade 87 event, aka Chi Town Heat. However, Dusty was stripped of the title for attacking NWA President Jim Crockett. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Whoopsie! Harry Wyndham would defeat former champion Nikita Koloff in a tournament final for the vacated belt. By this point, it is May of 1988. During this time period, the... Uh, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling Promotion would be renamed WCW. However, it is still recognized as an NWA title. Lex Luger would win it at Chi-Town Rumble for losing it to Michael Hayes at Wrestle War, who only held it for 15 days for Lex Luger, won it back, notching up a historic and record-breaking 5 123 day reign. That means he went from May 22nd in 1989 up to October 27th of 1990, where at Halloween Havoc, the rough and tumble cowboy himself, Stan the Man Hansen, would win his first United States Championship. However, 50 days later, Lex Luger would win the belt back at Starcade in a Texas Bull Rope match, holding it for another 210 days. During this period, WCW split from the NWA, and the title was officially renamed the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship. Thus, yes, Lex Luger is the first WCW era United States Champion. The title was eventually vacated at the Great American Bash 1991 when Lex Luger won the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Sting would defeat Steve Austin, yep, the future Stone Cold, in a tournament final for the vacant belt at a house show in Atlanta. 86 days later, Rick Rude at Clash of the Champions 17 would win it, holding it for 378 days for vacating it due to injury. Dustin Rhodes would pick it up, defeating Ricky Steamboat in a match, holding it for 138 days for Dustin, uh, was vacated by the WCW Board of Directors due to the title being declared held up after a controversial title defense against Rick Rude. Dustin would later win it back in August of 1993. 119 days later, stunning Steve Austin won it at Starcade 93 in a 2 out of 3 Malls Falls match for 240 days. Ricky Steamboat would then win it back, notching 25 days at Clash of the Champions 28. However, Steve Austin was not done, and at Fall Brawl 94, was awarded the title due to Ricky Steamboat being injured. However, he lost it minutes later to Hacksaw Jim Duggan. This being one of those moments that 
started making Steve think maybe WCW was not where he would be uh, able to achieve his most potential. 100 days after Jim Duggan won it at Starcade, the monster Vader would win it. Holding it for 88 days for being stripped of the title by WCW Commissioner Nick Bockwinkel for hospitalizing Dave Sullivan one week prior. Nick Bockwinkel, of course, being a great legend and Hall of Famer himself, mostly in the Minnesota-based AWA. Sting would win it for the second time, defeating Meng, in, a.k.a. Haku, depending on your favorite promotion he's appeared in. At the Great American Bash, for 148 days for Kensuke Sasaki, would win it in Tokyo, Japan, for 44 days at a New Japan Pro Wrestling event. The man who won it being One Man Gang. In a post pay per view dark match at Starcade World Cup of Wrestling in Nashville. A month later, Mexican Lucha legend Conan would win it at a main event taping, managing 160 days before Ric Flair comes back and gets his fifth raid, which would last 141 days before shoulder surgery led to another title vacation. Or vacating. Eventually, the future legend, Eddie Guerrero, would win it at Starcade, managing a 77-day reign before losing it to his real-life best friend, Dean Malenko, at Uncensored in 1997. The infamous Uncensored, which pretty much was a horrible pay-per-view every year. Although Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko could put on a great wrestling match no matter what the context and what else was going on on the card. Dean Malenko would lose it back to Jeff Jarrett at a Nitro in Boston, who would lose it to Steve McMichael as part of their feud at Clash of the Champions 35. Steve only managed to hold it for 25 days before Kurt Henning won it at a Nitro taping, managing 104 days before DDP. Bang! <laughs> Got his first reign at Starcade from Washington, D.C., getting a nice 112 days. Losing it at Spring Stampede to Raven, who held it for one day before Goldberg won his first championship in April of 98, making it 77 days before vacating it after winning the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Canada's favorite wrestler, Brett the Hitman Hart, would win it next at a Nitro taping, defeating Diamond Dallas Page for the vacant title. However, three weeks later, he lost to Lex Luger, who lost it back to Brett after three days at a Thunder taping, who 74 days later lost it to Diamond Dallas Page, who 35 days later lost it back to Brett Hart, who held it for 70 days, winning it in a no-disqualification match before Roddy Piper would win it for a third time, holding it for 13 days before Scott Hall would show up at Super Brawl 9 and get a nice 25-day reign before being stripped of the title by WCW President Ric Flair. Next, we would see Scott Steiner win it at Spring Stampede, beating Booker T in a tournament final. Whew. Scott Steiner was later stripped of the title by WCW President Ric Flair as well. The title being awarded that same day to Ric Flair's son, David Flair, who after 35 days, his heelish luck would run out when the Canadian Crippler, and yes, I have to say this again, for many of the same reasons I had to say about Jimmy Snuka, the infamous Chris Benoit would win it in August of 1999 at a Nitro taping holding it for 34 days before losing it to Sid Vicious for 42 days, who would lose it to Goldberg, who held it for a single day before Bret Hart won it the next night at Nitro. Goldberg having won it at Halloween Havoc. 
Bret Hart managed two weeks before Scott Hall would win it in a four-way ladder match, also involving Sid Vicious and Goldberg. Chris Benoit would get a second reign, winning it at Starcade when Scott Hall suffered a knee injury and Benoit was awarded the title. However, a day later, Jeff Jarrett at Nitro would win it in a ladder match. Before he got injured, the title was vacated. And in December or on December 20th, however, Jeff Jarrett, or excuse me, Jarrett initially won it in December 20th. He vacated it on January 16th at sold out pay-per-view. However, one day later, the injury came into question because Jeff Jarrett was awarded the title back by WCW Commissioner Kevin Nash. Jarrett's title reign will last 84 days before. In April 10th, 2000, the Great Reboot happened, in which all WCW titles were declared vacant by Vince Russo and Eric Bischoff. Scott Steiner would win it at Spring Stampede in a tournament final before being stripped of the title when he used the band Steiner recliner submission hold on Mike Awesome at Bash to the Beach. 11 days later, Lance Storm would win it. In the tournament final, Storm unofficially renamed the title of the WCW Canadian Heavyweight Championship, uh, putting stickers of the Canadian flag over the various face plates as part of that unofficial renaming of it. Terry Funk would win it back on September 22nd in a house show. However, a day later, Blaine Storm would win it back at a, another house show holding it for 36 days before losing it to Hugh Morris, at this time going under the General Rection gimmick as part of the MIA stable, having defeated Lance Storm and Jim Duggan in a handicap match at Halloween Havoc. Lance Storm would regain the title belt back after 12 days, though winning it on the November 10th Nitro from London, England. 16 days later, General Rection would win it back at the Mayhem pay-per-view, holding it for 49 days before Shane Douglas, who had, of course, been in WCW early in his career before being in ECW and WWE and ECW, and had come back to WCW, won it for the first time at the Sin pay-per-view on January 14th in a first blood chain match, holding it for 22 days before losing it to Rick Steiner on February 5th at a Nitro taping, who would lose it 41 days later to Booker T on March 18th, 2001 at the Greed pay-per-view, which was the last pay-per-view held by WCW as shortly thereafter, WWE would take official possession of WCW. And that is where we are going to end it, folks, because as I said, um, the WWE section really kind of deserves a run. Um... Technically, I could go a little farther and go through the Invasion era because at the end of the Invasion story arc thing, the title was deactivated for a short period. But I'm going to go ahead and just lump that in because it was done under the WWE ownership and the WWE booking. So I'm going to call this the where we're dividing the eras. Still, I hope you enjoyed this ride, and let's go ahead and notch it out. Uh, we're going to toss out a few more stats for you. The most number of combined days holding the title is by Lex Luger, who has held it for 950 days. Uh, Lex is also tied along with Ric Flair, John Cena for the WWE era. Um, so really, we're going to skip him. Uh, half credit Chris Benoit because he also held it in WWE to get five reigns. So really, pure WCW era. Um, Ric Flair, Lex Luger, and Wahoo McDaniel all had five reigns each. Which, as I said, is tied for most number of reigns. Um, 
Ric Flair also has the second number of combined days at 773. Uh, our buddy Wahoo McDaniel only managed uh, 300 days. So, this means, of course, that Lex Luger wins our award for the wrestler who can most be associated with this championship. As at 950 days, he held it for a respectable amount of the championship's history, as well as being tied for winning it the most number of times. That's pretty impressive. And makes a big statement about Lex Luger's drawing power. The fact that he managed a pretty decent amount of reigns every time he held the belt. Let me just go back to real quick. See what his Uh, his shortest reign being three days, but to be fair, this was in 1998, uh, at a time when a lot of championships were being hot-shotted. Uh, before that, if you look at the more classic era, at his, in his first four reigns, his shortest reign was 76 days. Which is, you know, as I said, impressive. Still, we're going to wait a month because I don't want to overload to the professional wrestling fans in November to discuss the WWE history. So go ahead and join us in December for that. Uh, next week, we're going to have some more fun with some other forms of entertainment because we here at Roulette Productions like to give everybody a little something. No matter what you're into, we're going to try and cover you. Please go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell like the video, recommend the video to your friends, leave comments, suggestions for future topics. We like all feedback. As long as you keep it constructive. It doesn't have to be positive, but it does have to be constructive. Because that is our rule here at Roulette Productions, we are not here to hate, we are not here to poo-poo on the honest efforts of creators and entertainers. So, we show the love. Nothing up my sleeve. No dagger to put in the back of any entertainers. You're going to bring us something good. We're going to go ahead and respect the effort. Still, I'll see you in seven days. Let's see what the next topic will be. You'll have to tune in to find out. Bye-bye, folks.